The 90s nostalgia is real. Welcome to the conversation, everybody. I'm Jessica Burbank, here to unpack the new resurgence of 90s culture and reflect on the decade that many people forgot about is Lizzie Ratner, who's the senior editor at The Nation magazine. And they've just dedicated their recent issue to reflecting upon the 90s. So thank you so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about what inspired this issue. Well, I think, you know, the 90s often get overlooked, as you mentioned. They're sandwiched between the 1980s, the rise of the Reagan era, neoliberalism, end of the Cold War, big hair, shoulder pads, you name it. And then 2000 comes and you have this contested election, Bush v. Gore, then you have 9-11, then you have the wars on Iraq and Afghanistan in reverse order, Hurricane Katrina. 2008 Great Recession. And so the 90s are just kind of sandwiched in the middle of this, people forget about it. But if you actually stop to think about the 90s, um, which seemed like this tame decade, Clinton was president, there was a balanced budget, even a surplus, there was no Cold War. You actually stop to think about it and you realize that much of what happened during that decade was foundational. And that much of what's happening now can be explained if you just kind of tilt your gaze back and spend some time wandering the corridors of 90s nostalgia. And I can I love talk about lots of ways how. Yeah, yeah, super interested, especially you know during the Clinton era, people always say he did such a good job economically, but actually the conditions of forcing the private sector to go into a recession or, or to go into a deficit is what led to the recession a few years later. Can you just say more about the politics of the 90s shaping the years afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I think there are many forces at work, but just looking at sort of the two main ones in this country, the two main obvious ones, the Democrats and the Republicans or the right and the center left. Um, you can really see that both in terms of where we are today with the right and then uh, in terms of the burgeoning left, both the seeds really are laid in the 90s. So what do I mean by that? Let's talk about Trumpism and the right wing that we have today. Look back to the 90s and you have the rise of Pat Buchanan, who ran for president three, time in the, three times in the 90s. You have the Gingrich Revolution, you have the rise of Fox News. You have all these figures and forces um, that are still at work today, kind of really beginning to flourish in the 90s. And what they do is they build off and also rework the Reagan era politics um, into a politics of grievance into a politics of nativism. Buchanan realized that with Reagan in power in the 80s, there was this new vacuum on the far right that could be exploited and needed to be exploited and resurrected and returned to. And that's what he sort of tried to do in the 90s. And so we start seeing this politics of grievance, as I said, that we have today. And um, we start seeing the return of native, nativism uh, you have Buchanan talking about building a wall or building a fence at the border. Um, and so this sort of familiar culture warrior, angry white politics, frankly, really is promoted initially by Pat Buchanan, Newt Gingrich, and the so-called paleo conservatives of that era, picked up by Fox, Fox News, picked up by the Hannity's and Rush Limbaugh's and kind of percolates and marinates and then flourishes with Trump. So I think it's important to recognize Trump is not sui generis. There's nothing totally novel about him. His antecedents really were in the 90s. So that's kind of one side of the picture. Now let's talk about Clinton and the Democrats. They'd been wandering in the wilderness during the Reagan era and desperate to get back in power. And you have Clinton win on this kind of centrist, somewhat neoliberal platform. Um, he gets into power and he is quickly challenged by this new and resurgent right. And he in turn starts migrating further and further to the right. Now keep in mind, he was never a leftist candidate to begin with. He was perfectly happy to use racism to get his way into power and sort of throw people like Sister Solja under the bus or uh, Ricky Ray Rector who was uh, on death row and a, a black man who he went back to Arkansas to murder so that he could kind of build up his campaign. So he was never a liberal, but as you start seeing um, uh, the new Gingrich, Gingrich revolution and sort of he's being challenged in Congress, you have this resurgent right. He migrates rightward, embraces this uh, 
kind of technocratic form of neoliberalism. So pausing for a second, I know I'm talking a ton, but it's hard to cram it all into such a short amount of time. Um, you really have neoliberalism embraced at a government level in the 80s with Reagan. And that really wasn't the Democratic Party platform then. Clinton gets in and he calls himself a new Democrat and he sort of tries to shape a new identity for the party. And it's one that embraces free market capitalism and this Reagan style neoliberalism, but with a sort of human face. Um, so anyway, you have these sort of Clinton migrating rightward um, and also embracing this sort of neoliberal already rightward politics. And what that does is two things. One is it leaves uh, the right nowhere really to go except further and further to the right because the Democrats now kind of own the center and the sort of right. Um, at the same time, the Democratic Party is kind of dismissing and quashing um, the left. And with the end of the Cold War, there was this idea, well, you know what, anti-capitalism, socialism, the welfare state, the New Deal, that's all dead. That is now in the dustbin of history. So anyone who talks about that stuff is just kind of cockamamie and crazy. So there was very little dedication on the part of the Democratic Party to those ideas and to nurturing those ideas. So that's kind of a really garbled kind of mile a minute description of some of what was at work at that time in the political sphere. I love this. Uh, it sounds like today, the, the 2020s are more like the 90s. Uh, beyond the blue eyeshadow coming back, right? So what can the left learn or or people who are activists or consider themselves progressives from how similar folks were treated in the 90s? I think there's uh, several things. The first is that the left is in much better shape actually now um, than we were in the 90s. Naomi Klein has a beautiful brief essay in this 90s issue of ours that talks about the left wandering in the wilderness in the 90s. And um, and she thinks that compared to then, the left is in much, much better shape. It's more robust, it's got a much sharper anti-capitalist analysis. It's got, uh, it's got a feminist analysis, it's a decolonial analysis. It's much less significantly white. It's actually lots, you know, powered and peopled by people of color in a way that the left, the self-declared left in the 90s was not. So we're in a better place. That being said, I think one thing that the left can always know and remember is that um, you just have to keep on doing the work. And even if it seems like we're wandering in the wilderness, you're planting seeds for the future. So um, one or two examples, and then there's actually a great quote I'd love to read from Naomi Klein's piece. But you know, in the 1990s, in 1992, you had the LA rebellions um, where, you know, black residents and residents of all colors, but um, you know, sort of black people in LA rose up and said, the police are not gonna just be allowed to beat people um, and get away with it. And um, and it was huge and it was um, of unspeakable significance. And um, and there were many more sort of anti-police brutality protests in the 90s in New York, where I'm from. There was a month of protests against the murder of Amadou Diallo, and um, and so like people were acting then, and I think sort of that ultimately carried over into what became Black Lives Matter. You know, 20 years later, it took 20 years, but people were acting and people were thinking and people were doing um, specifically and most important of all in Black communities. Um, you know, the WTO protests in 1999 really did pave the way for some of what would become Occupy Wall Street, which would be paved the way for Democratic Socialists of America and some of the other stuff we're seeing today. Um, reproductive rights movement born in the early 90s. So I think it's really important to remember that a lot of the fruit of what we're doing now, we might not see it. We might not see it for a long time, but it will bear fruit. So with that in mind, and because I'm old enough to remember the 90s well, I have to adjust my glasses because I'm old, <laughs> so pardon me. So Naomi Klein writes in this beautiful essay, um, I often pictured us, the relatively small and marginal group that still identified as leftists in those days, as jamming our foot in the heavy door of history so that the full weight of neoliberal power would not succeed in slamming it shut completely. We bruised some toes in our efforts, but we did hold it open a crack. 
just enough for a new generation to come along and kick it wide open. Um, and I feel like uh, those words are resonant. They resonate with me as somebody who was alive back then and thinking, you know, where is the drama? Where is the resistance? There was some, it just wasn't hugely visible, but it percolated, it bubbled, it stewed enough that other people could ultimately, you know, sort of pick up the torch or whatever cliche you want to use, you know, blow on the embers and uh, allow them to burn a lot stronger. And you've also, you and the other editors have said that there's kind of a mirroring of the political correctness we see today to that of the 90s. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I would say it's so much a mirroring of the political correctness as the um, the culture war issues that bloomed back then are astonishingly similar. Um, the language is slightly different. So back in the day, the right wing, which you know, really they were the ones who fomented the culture war, and they actively, you know, Pat Buchanan and the like, actively decided the culture war is the way to kind of win us votes and power. Um, they were the ones who spoke out against multiculturalism as this awful boogeyman and um, political correctness, ah, evil. And you really see that mirrored today um, in allegations and accusations against woke culture and allegations and accusations against critical race theory and things like that. And so um, really what's surprising is this thing that seemed like this you know, hoary bygone uh, thing you'd rather not remember is now you know, we're reliving it. And that's a bit of a bummer, frankly, to have to go back and relive it. You all have done such a good job reflecting upon the 90s, drawing lessons out and really summarizing what happened in a decade of politics and culture. Can you just say where people can follow your work and maybe get a copy of this if they would like to read through? Ooh, absolutely. Um, so our website is www.thenation.com and you can find our special issue there on the 90s if you go to the little icon that says, Current issue or issues, um, and yeah, we're at Twitter. We're or on Twitter. We're at the Nation, um, and please, please come and read the issue because there's a number of fantastic pieces on everything, from food to gender and sexuality to literature to house music to. Uh, and now I'm going to go blank all of a sudden. But to, oh my gosh, AOL and Facebook, and sort of AOL is a precursor to Facebook. So tons of excellent stuff there. And uh, please come and read it all. Amazing. The 90s are back. I think a lot of people will go through and read that. Thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Thanks.